the rake. During the summer of 2003, events in the northeastern United States involving a strange human-like creature sparked brief local media interest before an apparent blackout was enacted. Little or no information was left intact, as most online and written accounts of the creature were mysteriously destroyed. Primarily focused in rural New York State and once found in Idaho, self-proclaimed witnesses told stories of their encounters with a creature of unknown origin. Emotions ranged from extremely traumatic levels of fright and discomfort to an almost childlike sense of playfulness and curiosity. While their published versions are no longer on record, the memories remained powerful. Several of the involved parties began looking for answers that year. In early 2006, the collaboration had accumulated nearly two dozen documents dating between the 12th century and present day spanning four continents. In almost all cases, the stories were identical. I've been in contact with a member of this group and was able to get some excerpts from their upcoming book. A Suicide Note, 1964 As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence, and once I awoke and saw his form, once again I awoke and heard his voice, and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose and one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Linny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name. A journal entry, translated from Spanish, 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand, I will not sleep. His voice, unintelligible text, Mariner's Log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep, from the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything, we must return to England, we shall not return here again, at the request of the rake. From a witness, 2006. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip from Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving, so my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 a.m., I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologised and told him I thought he got out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly, his knee almost knocked me out of the bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. 
After adjusting to the dark for half a second, I was able to see what caused the strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man or a large hairless dog of some sort. Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to five. It just seemed like a while, just looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway, leading to the kids' rooms. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter, Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, He is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night while rushing our daughter to the hospital. They did not survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents' house after we decided to return home. I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located to the man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now refer to as the rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believe to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history or follow up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages and never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of an, the encounter saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night, for two weeks. 
I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day. When I woke up, by the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before and now believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time but for some reason the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up to see him staring at me. Dinner is now served. The forest seemed to be a void of green as I ran through it, a never-ending mess of trees and shrubbery. I felt my feet stamp down on sharp sticks and thorns, but I never felt any pain. After dealing with the harshness of this tropical rainforest, the soles of my feet had become hard and sturdy. I doubt even a freshly broken piece of glass could penetrate through the rough skin. Not that I'd ever get to test it. Each bound I made I got further and faster towards what I was looking for. I knew how to track animals, so this wouldn't be too hard. Follow the prints, look for broken branches, think like the hunted. I could hear it run as well. It was clumsy and making too much noise. Suddenly the thing stopped running. I could have heard its heavy breathing from a mile away, but instead of catching up to it, I stopped as well. This chase had barely started. I hadn't had a lot of fun yet. Survival is also about entertainment, not just nourishment. If I was to survive on this island, I had to keep myself occupied, keep reminding myself that I was alive, otherwise there is little stopping me from falling into madness. I could see it through the trees. It had come into a clearing and it was now resting, trying to catch its breath. I decided to get a better look at it. I scampered up a tree using my hands and feet as hooks, swinging around the branches, a monkey performing for no one. I came to a branch that viewed down on the clearing. Now it was looking around, wondering where its pursuer had gone. Also from my branch there was a wide gap in the trees. The view sprawled out, showing a blanket of trees rising and falling with the changing levels of the landscape. Beyond the green was the blue of the ocean, the ocean that had damned me to this wretched, God-forsaken island. Where I had made my home, its waves had destroyed my vessel, thrown away my crewmates like rats, and then brought me to fester here. Neither heaven nor hell, I would remain in this limbo until my decaying corpse fertilises the soil. I looked back down at my prey, 
it was still looking around, trying to find me. It was only a matter of time before it would look above and see me. Good. I wanted it to. No run, no fun was my motto. As I thought it began looking up in the trees, our eyes met. There was a hesitation before it once again bolted off into the forest. I let out a loud whoop and the chase was back on. As I kept running, I saw herds of animals run quickly into the vegetation, startled by the disturbance that my prey and I were causing in this usually peaceful sanctuary, previously free from the chaos of humankind caused. I saw flashes of all sorts of exotic animals, large and small, but I never paid any attention. I had already locked onto my target and any distractions could prove disastrous. I stopped again, silence. It had stopped running again. I couldn't hear it anymore. No breathing, nothing. It was hiding from me. I looked around, slowly drawing my makeshift knife that I crafted from a piece of sharp stone. Where are you? Come on. I know you're there. I said, not really talking to anyone. Sometimes the sound of your own voice can increase your determination and confidence. A large thing jumped out the bushes, coming straight for me. It got me from behind, so I wheeled around and jabbed the knife into its side. It screamed in pain and struck me in the head. I stumbled back, dazed, more from the shock than the pain. I saw it scramble away clumsily. Due to the wound I had inflicted, I got my senses in a few seconds, spitting out some blood on the grass. I adjusted my bow on my back. Now it was going to end. After being injured, the thing was now a lot easier to track. Blood made a trail on the trees and plants as it stumbled over logs. I could just make out the colour of it slowly disappear. I ran along to the side so I could cut it off. It then appeared in the gap in the trees, a perfect opportunity. I pulled out an arrow and clipped it onto my bow. I pulled the string back. Closing one eye to aim, I let go and the arrow flew through the air whistling as it went. I heard a thunk, a painful shout, and the sound of a body collapse onto the forest floor. I walked slowly over to my prey, stone dagger in hand to finish it off. I saw it writhing on the floor, the arrow I had shot sticking out the back of its shoulder. It twisted to see the predator that had finally shot it down. Broad bent. The sailor shouted in confusion. Good day, Lieutenant. I replied calmly. Nice to see you. What the devil are you doing? I squatted down next to him. Surviving, sir. Surviving. I raised the dagger and before he could cry out in protest, I brought it down into his throat. Dinner is served. That's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed tonight's scary stories, then don't forget to subscribe and click the like button and click the bell icon to get notified every time I upload. 
If you have any scary stories you would like narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares. Now, good night, my little hellhounds.